My name is Pete Westover. I am uh, part of the older generation that has done so much to put the planet in a very dangerous place. And these young <laughs> folks are now in a position to turn things around, I hope. Um, so the, the subject is going to be uh, what students can be doing and what are, are doing to address climate change. And let me read the, um, the, the short bios of, of each person. So this group is from Deerfield Academy. And um, Megan Ng is a third year junior at Deerfield. She's from Hong Kong. And this is her second year being involved with the school's sustainability group, the Eco Reps. Uh, Iris Wong here is a junior at Deerfield. She's also from Hong Kong and is part of the Eco Reps and spends her afternoons at the greenhouse and helping out at local farms. And Rich Calhoun has been teaching physics, sustainability, and environmental science at Deerfield Academy for the past 15 years. His classroom work these days focuses on effective science communication and encouraging students to explore the intersections between justice, business, and the environment. Sounds fantastic. So uh, the two other speakers, uh, Lori Bouchada is here, Middle school science and math teacher, member of the Deerfield Energy Committee. Um, Lori began her teaching career as an environmental educator on Savoy Mountain in Florida, on Martha's Vineyard and at a nature, uh, nature sanctuary south of Boston. She aspires to em emulate the Lorax. <laughs> as a middle school math and science teacher for 23 years, she infuses the curriculum with environmental awareness, inviting guest speakers on local and regional issues and encouraging students to use their voices. And then Yuli uh, Nagel, uh, Director of Energy Save and Cooler Communities Programs at the Harold Grinspoon Charitable Foundation. I had breakfast with Harold last, uh, last year at his house, and uh, boy, is he something. <laughs> Uh, fueled by concern about climate change, Yuli Nagel, a longtime climate activist and her Pilates uh, client and philanthropist, Harold Grinspoon, founded Energy Safe in 2017, initially focusing on increasing access to mass utilities incentives programs. In 2019, she adapted a pilot project from Concord Mass called Cooler Concord for use in a variety of communities and has since been working on connecting classroom learning to climate solutions in Massachusetts communities. Despite the challenges of COVID, the Cooler Communities Program was able to grow from two to five to nine participating school districts over the past three years with programs including as few as five and as many as a thousand students. Yuli is also a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, Living the Change, Berkshires, and Sociocracy for All. So thank you all for being here, and I will let you go first. Megan and I are still sticking on the So roughly speaking, we'll try to take 15 minutes for each, but if you go over, I don't think anybody will object. Well, I think we may go under a little bit and also enjoy conversation and collaboration as well. Okay, so. great. <laughs> Deerfield Academy student initiatives today. So I'll start with our first one, which is on composting. This is one of our big programs at school. We do composting in dorms. Um, mostly like there are bins around campus for composting as well. And it was challenging during our COVID years, but it has picked back up. So one of our biggest initiatives within composting is our school cafes. We have two cafes there, and all of our flatware and dishes are compostable. So that includes all of our spoons, our forks. Um, I think we get like our ware and our dishes from seven different bins so that we can keep all of them compostable. And have our bins also labeled to show that these can all be put there so that um, any new students can also go to be familiar with the program quickly. Um, so, Part of our student staff outreach is a collaboration with our CSGC, which stands for the Center for Sustainability and Global Citizenship. And these include study abroad trips where students get to travel to, I think, example, for example, Florida, um, to learn more about marine ecosystems, and also a variety of different events and activities that we each host. 
Um, I'm part of this board as well, and I've hosted some community um, service activities where students can join in and just learn more about climate change. Um, in addition, we also work with this club to host Earth Day celebrations, and last year that included a hike to the rock, um, and also in general just um, experiences where students can um, be exposed to nature more often um, since we have a great campus and we hope that other students can also take advantage of this. And um, a great example of this is also river cleanup activities um, where students can just help out with um, just sustainable community service activities around campus. Um, another Green Cup, another activity is called the Green Cup Challenge and this is one of the favorites among our students. Um, and this is basically an annual competition on campus where different dorms compete to try to reduce their electricity consumption. And last year my dorm actually won. We lived in dormants. <laughs> yeah, we did not turn on the lights. We had LEDs on the hallways. It was, it was a struggle, but we won. <laughs> I forgot what we got for it, but it was a great experience, and it's just a great chance for students who aren't normally aware of sustainability on campus to pitch in and join in um, for these activities. And, it, and to, to, to join in, adding the interscholastic piece a few years ago, I think helped make it less dorm versus dorm within the school, but also looking <laughs> at larger groups of students at different schools, and it turned into a friendly, collaborative sort of I don't know. It was never a, we're getting mad at our rival schools. Um. It was always <laughs> kind of a how far can we go with this? And it, I really liked that. Um, another big part of our community is the greenhouse. So this is primarily run by my biology teacher. Um, so for on the side of like teaching organic farming techniques, we pretty much grow whatever we like under his supervision, and he teaches us how to plant, for example, carrots, like how to spread out the seeds. Um, we grow like all sorts of flowers, snapdragons. We have carrots, beets, like peas, spinach. I think everything, I, mean, I get my salads from there, so I make my own dinner with that. Um, it's is, like, your, is your greenhouse needed? Yes, it is. Um, and so, especially it gets cold in the winter, um, we can still keep it running. But it's offered as a co-curricular option, so that's what I'm taking right now. And um, while the greenhouse isn't large enough in scale to support the whole like meal for the school, some of the vegetables do help provide for the meals um, for the greater student body. And part of this like experience also means that we can incorporate some learning that is more hands-on and within the classroom um, when we take a break from just learning from the curriculum and going to the greenhouse and seeing for ourselves. Um, next up is dining services, which personally I think is one of the best things Deerfield has done surrounding sustainability. Um, so the dining hall has many different aspects which try to conserve our waste, including um, our meals, which um, all the leftovers either uh, are turned into some kind of salad bar option or are also, I think, donated to the... There are, before they're compost, there is some that goes to compost, but most is recycled into local farms for feed and things like that. And, you know, the dining hall has worked very, very hard to, to ensure that we're at zero food waste at this point. I mean, as close to zero as you can expect from teenagers, but <laughs> we've taken away their trays, we've taken away their ability to load food up, um, and it's really actually made a big difference. So, mm -hmm. anyway. There's also an emphasis on locally sourced meals, and once I think about once a term we have a meal that's entirely sourced from um, really local um, farms or stores and stuff like that. Um, and there's also an emphasis on grass-fed beef as well as plant-based beef. And personally, I don't. I'm off of beef, and I've noticed many more students um, going for the Beyond Burger option, which is great. Um, to see and there are also um, multiple student studies um, where I have a group currently doing more research where we're interviewing the dining hall to see if there's anything we can do to help and I do think there is work to be done with the students 
um, where there can always be increased awareness on how to take less food and have less waste when you can just go back for seconds. Um, but um, in general, the dining hall has done a great job um, of having systems which try to reduce her waste. And I think the, the big one that I my classes talk about a lot and our dining hall has really embraced is reduce red meat consumption as much as we possibly can. You know, beyond the food waste issue, it really is, from our perspective and the head of our dining hall is fully on board, it's the red meat. And so we've cut a lot of that out in subtle ways that this, sorry, that the students actually don't really know about. They, th that's been very intentional mm -hmm. over the years. So there are things that we put into our food these days that we didn't 10 years ago that they don't know about, but it's really moved us into a much healthier direction. Um, anyway, it's been very successful in the dining hall. Um, and to sum it up is our energy systems on campus. So we split energy consumption into sort of scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope one is sort of for the whole campus, um, from our heating systems, the ones that take up the most energy essentially. And then for example, scope three is the tiny ones like travels or um, just more individual energy consumption. So just looking at scope one itself, from like 2005 to 2020, we had around the 30% reduction in our energy consumption. And I don't remember the specific numbers, but like it's down by like, I think around 2,000 metric tons. I can look it up later, but um, this is what our environmental coordinator shared with us actually. And obviously last year when it was like COVID-19, um, that did take a hit, but then now we've started to bring it back down again. It's become a priority to us on campus as well. And um, that's also information we get from the progress reports um, on all of our systems that we've just mentioned earlier, including composting, the greenhouse, our food systems, water, and our Think 8020 program, which is the program that we use for recycling um, at Deerfield. And 80-20 waste diversion. So the idea is that we are recycling, reusing 80% and trying to reduce our landfill down to 20%. Um, and there are lots of ways we've tried to shift behavior subtly with waste bin sizes. Um, it actually, that seems to have been effective. Um, you make recycling bins big and waste bins small. And in the dorms, they behave differently. They spend more time breaking down the cardboard and yeah. as opposed to just dumping. So there, there are subtle things that we've tried over the years. We can always do more, but, but it's, it's worked very effectively with reducing our uh, landfill. I just want to say, I just checked just now, so that was um, correct. And then I want to add that the energy, energy efficient decisions that we make um, result in the reduced like greenhouse gas emissions around campus, which has been a priority for our school as well. So. And I think the, the, I'll stand up. It's my official part now. Um, and the, the other piece is um, in the science program in our history department especially, we've been incorporating more and more climate work and environmental, we have an environmental justice uh, elective for the first time in our history course. Um, we have a research and sustainability course, which is a post-AP research course. We're in coordination with the UMass permaculture people and various other uh, mushroom growers around the valley looking at micro-remediation and how we can use fungus and various other you know, treatments to work with Japanese knotweed on our campus and addressing kind of large systemic uh, sustainability questions in the valley. Um, we also have an electrical vehicle engineering course um, that has been very successful. <coughs> they produce all sorts of vehicles. They're building a snowmobile right now. They build bikes all day long and a bunch of ATVs. They, they haven't had a full-sized car yet but they are working in that direction. So our, our science curriculum, our history curriculum in particular, um, in the English department we also have two environmental writing courses that focus on you know, writing in the outdoors and writing from the perspective of nature. Um, so you know, our curriculum has really evolved as well over the last 10 years or so um, to be more in line with the work that we're doing around campus with our physical campus. that really quickly. Last year we had this D term where we could take an elective that we liked. One of the things was from field to fork, which is the one that I took, and we were able to speak to 
um, for example, Clarkdale Fruit Farms and also people who ran dairy farms or cattle farms on how we truly source our food. And for the final project, it was to make a meal at home from locally sourced ingredients. So I think this whole hands-on process and really talking to people who are like actually part of trying to improve the way that we think about where we get our food from versus you know maybe importing from like miles and mi thousands of miles away that has really helped me understand personally how we think of our food and where it all comes from and I think that that's going to be a bigger part of our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Do you know much about uh, whether your type of uh, programs are being adopted by other schools? I'm thinking of Frontier, but I'm also thinking of some of the private schools. My daughter went to Williston, and I know they're doing some of these, but I don't know how much. In, in the Valley, Northfield Mount Hermon is doing a lot. I mean, we, uh, we are not standing up here saying that Deerfield Academy is setting some sort of standard, but other schools are, are doing their own innovation. One of the things that, as an environmental science teacher, I think about is how can schools coordinate and communicate yeah. so that we can share the best ideas, yeah. so that we're not all reinventing the wheel and fighting the same fights. And you know, if somebody else has figured something out, it's great to hear. So yes, lots of other schools are doing lots of awesome stuff. Oh, well, you had a question. She just gave it to me. <laughs> okay. Other other questions for the group? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Do you have electric charging stations, electric car charging stations, are those open to the public? They, that's a good question. I believe that visitors to campus are welcome to use the charging stations. They are card based. So even employees and we have charging stations on campus that are open to the public if you're a visitor on campus. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I made a call though. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they're mapped on like a public charging map or anything. Yeah, but but so. no. Um, trying to, I lost his name, but he gave us gave me a lot of information to help me figure out charging station and stuff here. Dave, Dan, Dave, Dave Puritan. Dave Puritan. Um, and yeah. he's oh. more on the teaching side. He does the. Is that actually my neighbor. Oh, there you go. Go ask Dave Puritan. He's the master of all of us. Thank you. <laughs> In terms of your peer group, right? Uh, are most of your peers interested in the topic? And if they're not, what makes them become interested? Like, where's that line of, mm. oh, it's too much, I don't care, or um, to being okay, how can I be involved? Um, I would say that, for example, we're part of a student like group for sustainability. There's teachers supervising there, so for example, we're interested in it, so we signed up for it. But for the greater student body, um, they can actually learn about our programs just from like their daily life, like when they buy something at the school cafe. They also know that the things from there are compostable. So from that, like just having that many daily life integration, they actually grow to know more about like the sustainability measures at school. Like even if it's not the whole scale, we have so many systems around, but that can start to pique interest mm -hmm. um, in what school is doing like behind the scenes aside from academics and sports mm -hmm. like regular student life I would say and personally I find the academic side actually really helps bring some people to care a lot more about um, sustainability um, specifically Mr. Calhoun and Mr. Emerson's environmental science class is where I know a lot of students who just kind of went in just because they didn't know what science to take, but then ended up coming out of it transformed and being scared of the planet dying. Wow. Um, so I think that really plays a big part in helping um, students change, shift their mindset. And I think an increasing amount of students are pushing other students to take that class, as I'm trying to make my friends take it as well. Um, so I think that will just build more momentum um, for other students to keep learning more about that change. Peer to peer is the best. Absolutely. Great, great. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. Okay, um, so I have taught middle school at a couple different uh, in a couple different communities, and I have not taught a strictly environmental science class, um, but have managed to fit it into the curriculum in lots of different ways. And I'll share some of those. 
Um, so my overall philosophy, um, you know, my title said in an era, era of climate anxiety, even in general, a lot of our students are exhibiting anxiety just about life in general. Social pressures, um, social media stuff, um, academic requirements. So I have to, I feel like I have to tiptoe um, or just make sure I'm conscious of making sure I put maybe two thirds positive with one third reality <laughs> in there. Um, I actually had a student say to me at the beginning of last year, are we gonna learn about any good things? And that was like, oh boy, okay. Um, and there's so many good things that I really am happy and excited to share with my students. So I make sure that I teach the mechanics of climate change and with that, um, you know, we have to teach about concepts like the word net. Uh, fun thing that I managed to slip into my math class, we were talking about net when you're adding a positive number and a negative number and then I just slipped in a activity about net zero, what does that mean in the environmental field and we talked about things that put more carbon into the atmosphere, and that was our labeled red, those were negative numbers, and then we put things that sequestered carbon, trees, and then, so we, I managed to figure out a way, because hopefully they'll hear that word net zero out there, to connect a little math exercise to some climate issue. Um, we have to teach it about cycles in science, and so water cycle gives a lot of opportunity to talk about what's going on when the glaciers melting is not just rising the sea level, but it's reducing the stored fresh water. I mean, we are 70% water, but very little of it. So that's another graphing thing we have to do is talk about the different places that water are on the planet. So most of our fresh water was in, um, in glaciers. And it's a really important storage source for you know countries like Bolivia, Peru, all of the countries in the Andes. So there are lots of ramifications for losing those glaciers. And also a carbon cycle. There's lots of, lots of opportunities to talk about natural carbon cycles and then what happens when we add the fossil fuels in there and just the rate of putting more carbon into the atmosphere. So that's just to say that even not having a specific environmental science class, there's lots of avenues to put it into the standard curriculum. I like to talk about the things that government can do and has done. Um, I don't know if we need to link to that hyperlink, but um, that I've been teaching for a while, so I remember the first time CAFE standards, the uh, corporate average fuel efficiency um, standards were put into place and then they were lowered and I think they're gonna come back up to, I just heard, 40 miles per gallon might be the new standard, which is very doable and has been doable for a long time. But um, anyway, so to just make students aware of how things have changed and how the government plays a role, I like to introduce them to a lot of organizations that are addressing solutions to climate and especially spot spotlighting um, youth role models and then facilitate students sharing their concerns after they become aware of different issues. Okay, so what, now what I do now that I know this. Next. <laughs> so some of the organizations, and I don't think I'll, I'll um, I'm just gonna tell you about them because I don't wanna take up too much time, but that are really exciting and positive. Um, the Goldman Environmental Prize has I don't know, a number of winners every year from a multiple of countries. They have these great little four minute videos. I'm gonna show one in school tomorrow about a woman in Malawi dealing with plastics pollution. So they're all about people who have usually not um, wealthy academic scholars or anything, community members who see a problem and figure out a way to address it. Um, so they're very really <coughs> inspirational. Our Children's Trust, I don't know if people have been following that. Okay, there, um, it's, um, I think, maybe 20 students um, between the ages of 13 and 20, I think. I've had my students kind of do a little mini bio on these um, kids who came together with an organization to sue the government because we are not 
protecting the planet for their future. So uh, it's been fun to just follow what their, how their lawsuit has been going. Recently just learned about the Third Millennium Alliance. It's a group out of um, the Pacific coast of Ecuador and they have a way that you can support a farmer there. And they talk about the uh, value of preserving rainforest. The Sunrise Movement, as you know, is led by a lot of young people. And Greenpeace has a whole feature on uh, youth activists. Um, also, another thing that I've uh, shown the students is about the uh, Prince William Earthshot Prize which is pretty exciting. I think it's in its second year now. They've gone through one round of winners and one really exciting winner was a young woman from India. It's kind of <laughs> crazy to think about, but they have street carts that have coal-fired um, ironing services where you bring your clothes to be ironed on the street. Well, she created a solar cart so that she can do ironing by, and I think she's, you know, now that she's won this prize, it's gonna scale that up. So, young kid telling her story, that's exciting. Um, there's also, I can't remember, I think it was the city of Milan actually, um, won for some uh, organizing food waste. <coughs> there's lots of stuff going on about oyster farming. Um, other organizations that have been, yeah, go ahead to the next one. Okay, so here's some other uh, um, actions that I have the students do. Write letters to the editor. I know when I was working in Greenfield, there was a um, plastic bag proposal, and that did go through, and my students wrote letters to the editor about that. The pipeline threat a couple years ago was another issue that they wrote letters to the editor about. As a teacher, I have to give out information without you know, revealing any of my personal opinions, so, um, and also make sure that parents are aware of what the kids are writing. So those are all things to be aware of. Um, otherwise, you can get in trouble. <laughs> but you know, I've started to do the thing where the students can write the letter and then bring it home and send it from home if they're if the parents and let the parents know and if the parents approve. Uh, but we have gotten you know six by four by six glossy photos back from a very variety of presidents. Um, Governor Baker didn't send us anything, but students have always done a study of different energy sources and the pros and cons of oil versus wind versus solar versus gas. And that was actually uh, inspired by a group called NEED, I just put it down here, where they run um, teacher workshops and provide curriculum materials. Uh, Eversource also has an energy challenge where they have invitations for students to submit letters to the editor, different things for each different grade. Um, there was also an organization, I ran an after school program called Future City, where kids built their version of a city in the future, so it gave us a lot of opportunities to talk about waste and water and energy. Um, when I worked in Greenfield, we got to go to the zero net energy homes up there and put in a school garden at every school I've ever worked at. Uh, Amy Donovan came to our school and we set up school-wide composting. And the school I'm at right now, um, we've done that. And it's, it's a tricky issue depending on how you get your food. Right now where I am, they used to have everything compostable, but they didn't get reimbursed, reimbursed from the state for the food that they were serving. <laughs> so they went with a vendor that serves everything and, black plastic with cellophane on the top. And so there's only, you know, it's tricky. There's only so many, there's lots of issues constantly, but there's certain ones you can be effective about. Um, yeah, last one. Oh, just briefly, Kid Wind is another really exciting way to teach science because the kids made little wind t turbines and they got to immediately measure the effectiveness and it just brought up an opportunity to discuss wind and all of its uh, complications and issues involved. This is our garden at the school I currently work at. This is what the land looked like. It was so, so compacted. <laughs> uh, we spent a, a good afternoon digging out the soil and then bringing compost from my yard. The older kids were supposed to do a lot of the digging um, and they were outside <laughs> with the second graders. Second graders saw those trowels and they were all over it. So 
even kids that don't live in uh, Holyoke or Springfield really, I think, don't have enough time to get their hands in the dirt. And they just so much love it. So anytime I can do a little thing like that, <laughs> you can see she's got her cell phone in her hand, even in the picture. But they were pretty proud of their little garden. And it was beautiful this fall as well. We planted that last um, spring. And we'll go to the next one. Okay, and this is a composting. You can see Amy there. Um, the kids love to play around with all the worms. This was a, um, let me think, probably a 20 foot long strawberry bed. And it was really fun to build, it was fun to plant, and it was so fun to have the kids come out at recess and just love the strawberries. So, I think, is that my last picture? Oh no, and the last one, uh, this is the, um, Creme de la creme of my teaching career. We did a, um, a four mile there and back bike trip when I taught at the school in Greenfield. Um, and leading up to that, we talked a lot about transportation and the history of it and the rail and how we turned into mostly automobiles in this country. Um, and then we went to the Great Falls Fish Ladder and out to Unity Park. Um, some kids had never been on a bike before a couple I noted I realized why some boys decided they weren't going to come and I got them to change their mind last minute because they had only been on really little you know dirt bikes kind of thing and they didn't think they could make it so we got some donated bikes so that was that was super fun so just in closing I just want to say that it's so helpful when an outdoor uh, outside agency comes in so I'm excited that Ily's going to talk about that because teachers just have so much to cover. I hate to say that. As a math, math teacher especially, I feel like I have to at least expose them to you know, probability and statistics before the MCAS. Um, but when an outside agency says that we'll supply this, this, and this, and we'll make it all ready, and all you have to do is show up, and that kind of thing, I think it's just really helpful. So anybody that has anything to offer to the school, I think it's best to try and find a teacher as opposed to a principal who is um, extremely overwhelmed, especially coming out of COVID. But I, I think um, teachers want to do more things. They just feel sometimes exhausted from everything else they're dealing with daily all to get to it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any questions for her? Do you want to uh, put I'll in just your... Keep it there. But, yeah, that's the question going on. As I'm curious, working with, within the standards, do you find flexibility? I mean, is I mean, I hear what you're saying about teachers feeling stressed every day, yeah. and this is sort of an add-on. I mean, do you, do you, I how do, do you view credit in the standards? See, I curious. do. That's because that's my passion. Yeah. But I don't think um, all the teachers come from that point of view. Right. So um, the opportunities for professional development like NEED, um, which is, I don't know if it's a national organization, you know, that, that kind of thing is really helpful. Um, I think a lot of people don't feel equipped to talk about, you know, the environment if you don't follow it on a regular basis. Um, and also that line between doom and gloom and providing hope. So, um, yeah, I, don't, I think it is a, a personal decision. I find lots of places to put it in, um, but I don't think other teachers are necessarily well-versed. I don't think it's taught in school. <laughs> so, Jack. So to that point, Rich, um, I'm a public school teacher. I teach eighth graders science at a virtual public school. So we work with kids from all around the state. And it's one of about 30 standards. It's unfortunate it's kind of in the twilight rather than in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being sort of a personal passion if you find ways to pull it in. And we're lucky our school is connecting with Uli's group and cooler com uh, communities this year that that puts it in the front rather than the back but again you know we're doing MCAS next week and at the end of April and the first week of May and it's six days and you know unfortunately we're sort of standards driven rather than need driven. I just want to thank you so much for what you're doing and like going above and beyond and I'm inspired to hear that you know as a math teacher you're able to incorporate so much environmental education 
Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, like just sitting here thinking about how to augment and, and celebrate what you're doing to serve as a role model for other teachers, regardless of whatever curriculum they're teaching, because if you could do it as, I mean, I can see the, the connection to math, but maybe a lot of people can't, but it, there's, there's got to be connections to every single subject to, to, to be able to incorporate this important yeah. subject. Yeah, well, it definitely is. Um, I'd love to talk with you more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm Wendy from uh, Kula Communities, like we said, and it's a school grant program at the Harold Green School and Sherwood Foundation that basically connects classroom learning to climate solutions in the communities. Um, so this is Ron St. Amon, he's the science director at Springfield Public Schools, and he had a wonderful thing to say about our program the other day, so I said, can I write this down? <laughs> and he basically said, we all need this. Um, the students need to know that their learning is relevant. The parents need to know how to save money and energy in their homes. And the community needs it because we need young people to participate. And um, he said everybody has limited bandwidth, like what Laurie was just speaking to, you know. So where, how do we fit climate action into this limited bandwidth? He said we just need to know what's possible. So that was just the best endorsement I could possibly hope for, <laughs> for our program. Um, so we'll just go over quickly, like, um, why Kula Communities, how it works, a few examples, the results, and then keys to success. So yes, we already talked about a lot of students are anxious about climate change, and they need to be empowered and included in the conversations. They really need to be connected to solutions, because they do want to do something. And oftentimes, it happens that the knowledge and the learning about it is very theoretical. It's not necessarily connected to solutions, and especially not connected to solutions in the community that they're in. It's different here in those super duper examples that you guys gave, obviously. They're kind of trailblazers there. Um, on the other hand, we're finding that information about incentives for energy efficiency or about environmental threats um, or protections reach the choir, just like we are here today, right? There's a lot of choir and um, towns and cities can only meet their energy efficiency needs and goals if um, we get a, a significant engagement by residents. So we need to actually come together to look at the problem together and work on solutions. And the other thing is that efforts are often disjointed, like the school's doing something over here and the town's doing something over there and then the nonprofits are doing something over there and nobody's talking to each other. So that's why we saw an opportunity for young people to really be powerful educators and advocates and bring all of these groups together. It's super complicated, very ambitious, and um, still in its baby shoes. So like I said, we're leveraging curriculum-based education. We wanted to really be in the curriculum so that teachers don't have a lot of extra work, which they still do, but at least it kind of fits into the uh, system somewhere uh, to set a whole community on the path to smarter energy and climate choices. So um, the way it works is that we provide, let me just, um, we provide f up to five thousand dollars in grants to the school system, to the district or the school that participates, um, and that includes curriculum support, professional development, and and the school then basically applies this curriculum over the year, oftentimes just in the second half of the school year and then participates in an event, like here, this one in Agawam in 2019, uh, where the whole community gets invited and then everybody gets to see the students' projects. They get to talk to the community and say, this is how um, desalination <laughs> works. Or I mean, there's some amazingly sophisticated project that they work on and get to explain. We have, um, you know, we had uh, insulated homes, we had indoor gardening, we had all kinds of things, and this is where we're composting that we had upstairs just a little bit ago. Um, so we also help with marketing of the event and then tracking pledges because one thing that we do is we ask visitors that come to actually pledge action and we capture those pledges so that it's not just like your regular environmental fair where people come, look great, go home and you never hear from them again. We want people to fill out something either online or on paper and say, I'm going to do this. And then we follow up and kind of help them or make sure that that, if possible, happened. So um, these are, this is the original example in Concord. This is still the standard set in many ways. These people came up with the concept of a Kulu Communities event. And we had high school students research 10 action exhibits for the parents uh, from this book 
uh, called Kula Smarter, which is a little outdated at this point, but they looked at what are the 10 most powerful things a family or individual can do to help reduce carbon footprint. And in the meantime, we've moved away a little bit from that very narrow definition of reducing carbon dioxide emissions to including civics and you know broader impact in terms of making one's voice heard in the community or in the state house or you know things that Laurie was talking about. Very important. Okay, so um, to the point of um, you know people hear climate change and they think high school science. So we want to make sure that we're thinking, just like it was mentioned earlier, we're thinking science, we're thinking arts, we're thinking languages, we're thinking we can talk about climate in a million different ways. And so these um, high schoolers created a whole social media campaign advertising the event and making sure that I think they had about a thousand visitors to the event in Concord. And it was stimulating because they could see that their own talents fit into the conversation. You know, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be an engineer. You can be an artist and you can be a social media whiz and you can still participate. So we found like this easy to underestimate what students can do. We had one young woman in Hadley actually take on the organization of the whole program with a little bit of support. <laughs> that was Ali, right? Um, Jack's from Hadley. <laughs> And uh, she took on the whole thing with some support from her superintendent. It's a small district. And if it hadn't been for COVID, she would have pulled it off. She created a beautiful playbook for other students to follow. And that's we're now passing on you know, to other groups. So yeah, you just don't know what students are capable of. I don't know all students can be capable of, you know, if you just give them a chance to let their talents fly. So that was very inspiring. So here's some more examples, you know, you had Agawam, you can see now, we connected what the students learned in the classroom, which was all about insulation, to actually have a, having a vendor at the fair that signed people up for free energy efficiency audits, and that's the Mass Safe program that probably all of you have done. <laughs> if not, we should talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see some other exhibits there. And again, it's just great for students to be able to explain to adults, you know, what they've learned. and how it can be applied in the community. Let's keep moving. Um, so as we, yeah, some more examples. Again, home insulation, you know, how to build a very insulated home. This was on sustainable agriculture or agriculture for the future at a fair in the Berkshires. Um, so there's just so many, you know, angles at which you can approach the subject, obviously. Um, and then, the arts, like I mentioned, uh, I think as things, you know, as the news keep getting bad and worse and even worse, it gets more and more important to include art, I think, painting, drawing, poetry, music. We, we try to make all of those things parts of the events and the discussion, and I think it helps a lot for young people to be able to have that avenue also to express themselves. So here again, it was great because when both of you were speaking, Laurie and Rich, and you guys, um, you know, you already alluded to this. Um, we can write letters to the editors. This was to invite people to the fair, but we can write letters to the editors about um, legislative issues. A group of students in Sherborne, Massachusetts, uh, is just in the process of getting past a um, resolution that the town declare climate emergency. So they can do that within school, in, within their school curriculum. Um, parameters, at least in the club that they're in. Yep, more examples. Um, presenting energy options. This was also an Aga one. Of course, uh, like after our first two pilots project, COVID hit. So we actually came up with a virtual version for all of this, which was beautiful. And we're going to see some pictures of that um, in a minute. Um, but yeah, these posters were done by very, I can't remember now how old they were, but by fairly young people about um, the different kinds of energy and their advantages and dangers. And this was a creative way to reuse <laughs> soda bottles. <laughs> it's just so gorgeous, <laughs> the whole project. It's beautiful, too. Wasn't it gorgeous? Yeah. yeah. So this is the, um, the virtual event that Agawam did last year. They repeated it. Um, in two consecutive years. And we basically created this website and it had a link to the uh, students' projects and then one for town projects. So oftentimes 
you know, residents have no idea that their town is a green community or that their town has an MVP grant. I mean, who would know that and why should they? So we had a whole page that explains those connections and then it had an event schedule for all the different workshops and presentations that we had online and then the taking action button and we're going to take talk more about that in a second. So yes, yeah, so like I said, the whole idea is that the visitors don't just come, they actually do something or pledge to do something. And so we kind of track this here. We had this gorgeous big poster <laughs> where we track the pledge forms that people handed in and made a small donation to a local charity for each one. So there was an extra incentive for the visitors to pledge. Um, we also have this, um, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, this action page, which is quite sophisticated, built by a group out east called Mass Energize. <laughs> I was on a, on a Zoom call when I did all this, and I forgot, oops, I forgot to take out my phone yeah. down there. <laughs> so she keeps popping up. <laughs> um, anyway, so so on this page, you can, it's like a, it's like a, I don't know what you call it, like a marketplace for the whole community where people can take action and find out information on service providers, they can see events that are coming up, and they can talk to their neighbors. And I think the next slide shows you what the action page looked like. So each community gets to define the kind of actions they want, and then people can go in there and they can uh, just create a login and say, I will do this, I will do this, or I have done this, or I have done that. So it's really fun because it's first of all, attractive looking, and then over time, you can see how this goes up for you personally and also for the whole community. We need to do a lot more work on that whole aspect of things because we didn't have much of, of a chance yet through COVID. All right, and then here's another example of, um, again, art to make the event more beautiful. And it's so expressive, isn't it? It's so gorgeous. Yeah, and we have um, Tim Blessed. I don't know, some of you may know him. <laughs> He's a, a social and climate activist and a rapper, and uh, he came and performed. The picture's a little bit not so ideal, right? With the <laughs> finger like that. <laughs> Anyways. Say, be the change. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now's the time, he thinks. Yeah, now's the time. Um, yeah, so this website that we were just looking at tracks the visitors' pledges and then makes it possible also to include people who couldn't make it to an in-person event. Um, and for, for instance, for um, Greater Commonwealth Virtual School, it's kind of perfect because they can create community across the whole state. And, um, and then we help the organizers, be it an energy commission or school personnel or a nonprofit group, to actually develop a plan to follow up on those pledges. So we hope to then, after like six months after the event, actually be able to say, look, as a result of this fair, X amount of people signed up for audits, X amount of people put solar on their homes. There's of course always like a bit of a delay in those major things, or X amount of people pledge to eat less meat, you know, once or twice a week. So um, we do want to hopefully create as many kind of clear metrics as we possibly can. So yeah, so the idea is that we all kind of come together, all these different community groups and people, and realize that saving energy in our climate is a cool thing to do. So it's not a bur you know it's not just a burden. It's not like this heavy thing, which it is, but um, we can create like a positive energy around the whole thing and a feeling of community. So these were our numbers that I was just talking about. We always try to gather. Um, and it was impressive to me that, you know, given the overwhelm and the freak out student and, uh, students, teachers, and school admin had to go through because of COVID, we still had five um, districts participate. So I don't know that we need any more slides than that. Let's see. Um, I guess we could just um, quickly jump one and then go, oh yeah, these are the ones that we're having this year. Uh, one of them is not able to follow through, but um, those are the communities that are gonna have an event this spring. And then maybe just very briefly, uh, the next one. It just explains the difference between typical energy fairs and then the cooler communities fair and how it's a lot 
more focused on reaching beyond the choir to find you know real clear commitments from people and to um, try to track the outcome. So I think maybe maybe that's enough for now. There's a few more if you're interested in the details you can go online and look it up. Um, we provide a cooler community playbook which is a very extensive website. Um, we help um, with you know uh, curriculum PD like I said you need committed volunteers, you need a real good support from the town and the school, and ideally you have K through 12 participate. Yeah, that's really the goal. And then um, we tailor the school grants depending on the scope of the event, and help with getting the word out. I think we can leave the slides at this point and just see if there's any questions. <laughs> I just think it's really exciting. I'm so glad that you're providing this. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it helps <laughs> schools make it happen. Yeah. How, many, how many are funded each year? So we're trying to raise money. Mm -hmm. We had a bit of trouble with that because of COVID, but we can, we can right now with our budget just now manage eight. Eight. So um, actually for next year, we're almost full for 23, mm -hmm. but uh, we're hoping to get more foundations on board because I think as sort of focus on COVID and direct survival and food and all of that shifts to, again, you know, bigger picture climate, including um, we'll be able to get more money so that we can expand. And is there an application process? Yeah, there's a real simple application mm -hmm. that we can talk about with that. Because uh, the other thing that every community is so unique, you really uh, can't have like a one size fit all cookie cutter program here. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we do a lot of preliminary conversations and, and kind of hashing out what works, you know, what can you do if it's not all grades, which grades could and how, you know, there's just so many specialties in every single situation, so we try to help make it work, yeah. Well, thanks so Sounds much. Like Thank you so much. Thank you.